After months of putting it off, it's time to come back to Twilight Princess, my beloved. Time travel is done time and time again in the Legend of Zelda series. To be honest, sometimes I forget just how often the series strays into that territory. Every single 3D Zelda game has time manipulation of some sort, whether it be through a traditional time machine, through abilities like stasis, or just being elements of the overall narrative. Twilight Princess uses it in a very different and pretty strange way. But before we get into our next dungeon, I think it's time to bring the linearity of Twilight Princess into question. Skyward Sword is often criticised for being far too linear, and I think in some ways, Twilight Princess selling so well and being received so well, cemented even more linearity as the direction that the series wanted to take in the late 2000s. But as we know now, it didn't really last for as long as they probably thought narrative-only experiences would. I am one of those people who is fairly critical of the linearity of Skyward Sword, so why do I give Twilight Princess a pass? The problem with the surface design in the former is that everything is designed like a dungeon. In Faron, Elden, and Lineru, you'll be doing everything in a set order, and largely you'll be finding these areas in the exact same order in every subsequent playthrough that you have. Now, that inherently isn't a problem. The problem I see a lot of people have is that the second set of dungeons in the game are in the same areas, but again, in theory, this is great. Going through the same areas in different ways can make for some great world building. The world design is so linear that I'd found any interesting mysteries around each of the regions really early on, and so there was nothing else to really surprise me the second time around. With the exception of the Sand Sea in Lanero, I'd say, I kinda like that area. Plus, the world building on the surface in Skyward Sword just wasn't the greatest overall in my eyes. So the reason I say all of this is that Twilight Princess is similar, right? For the final 5 or 6 dungeons in the game, you're technically re-exploring areas you've explored in the past. But the reason why I think this is done better is because, as an example, Gerudo Desert is technically an entire expansion onto Lake Hylia, Snow Peak is a huge expansion onto the Zora River, and the other 3 dungeons we're talking about today function very differently to adding more expansions to the map. Instead of expanding on the world, getting into these dungeons requires an expansion in your knowledge of the lore of this Hyrule, since we'll be going beyond Hyrule. For the Temple of Time, you're heading back in time. Instead of an expansion of the map, this dungeon gives you a feel of this Hyrule sometime in the past. The City in the Sky has you learning about the Uka tribe and why they seem to be dotted around Hyrule, and while they still remain a mystery to this day, their inclusion in the Era of Twilight still offers lore opportunities and questions today as well. And we get a good look at their culture in the form of the city in the sky, and the palace of twilight is literally everything we've been building up to and doesn't just serve as a dungeon, it was once used, and still is technically, as an actual palace for the twilight, a set of people you've had a minimal contact with up until that point in the game. Linearity aside, there isn't really that much to discuss when it comes to the gameplay at this stage in the game outside of the dungeons. There's a little side activity before heading into the city in the sky, but for the temple of time there's not too much. Make your way to the end of the sacred grove, do some little bits of stuff, and now you've unlocked the magic that is time travel. What did I say? Time travel is used a lot in this series. Let's get into the dungeon itself. I know a lot of people who think that the Temple of Time is the best or near best in the series, and this is actually a viewpoint that I don't completely understand personally. Don't get me wrong, I don't think it's bad, I just think it's good. The mini boss is one of my favourites in the entire series, if not my favourite in the form of a dark nut. For me, they are the pinnacle of design in the Zelda series. They fit the tone of Twilight Princess perfectly, they're not too easy that they can actually just be breezed through, and they offer a decent challenge. Plus, you're rewarded for actually getting some side bits which doesn't happen very often in the 3D games unless we're talking about heart pieces. Your time with the Dark Nuts will be made significantly easier the more sword skills that you have. So the more sword skills that you have, the more you feel like a badass, and in a game that presents itself in such an epic way like this game does, Small touches like that mean a lot, they mean the world. I mean, there's a reason why this fight with the Dark Nut is on the back of the box. Puzzle design wise, I've never been the biggest fan of the Dominion Rod and puzzles specifically designed around that idea. It's just not my cup of tea. It's definitely clever though, so I guess it gets some points there. Funnily enough, after talking about how linearity doesn't affect me in Twilight Princess for a couple of minutes at the top of this episode, I can't lie to you and say that the design of this one does it for me, because if I'm being completely honest, it doesn't, and I'm not entirely sure why that is. If you tuned into the last episode or you're watching the full retrospective in all of its glory, you know that I would sing the praises of Snow Peak Ruins until the sun came up if I could. 
So why do I give one really linear dungeon a pass, but not another? Well, I think it actually comes back to that exact same design philosophy as Skyward Sword, weirdly enough. I'm not someone who likes going through clear corridors to get to an area at the end, and I'll give the Zelda team credit here. Getting the Dominion Rod at the top of the temple and going back down in a different way is a cool idea, it just didn't land for me as much as it did with other people, clearly. But I can understand why others love it too. Whereas in contrast to that, Snowpeak Ruins has that linear design, but there are more open areas to explore. To me personally, it feels more lived in than it does to explore the Temple of Time. And I think that really matters to me with some of my favourite dungeons in this game. I can't even really imagine people walking around the Temple of Time. Goron Mines absolutely feels like a mine forged by the Gorons. Lakebed Temple feels like it once would have been used by the Zora. Arbiter's Grounds has the vibe and design of an old prison and Snowpeak Ruins is a mansion that was once used to protect a garrison. I am very much about the feel of a dungeon and the Temple of Time, while in the opening stages I can definitely see it being used for its intended purposes, in the end I can't see the rest being used for anything at all, it's just there to pad out the dungeon. That being said, I still think the atmosphere is great for what's going on and is one of the strongest points that I have going for the temple. I mean I'm not sure if it is the same since I haven't brushed up on the lore for a while, but the Temple of Time in this game looks a lot like the Temple of the same name in Ocarina of Time, and that just expands on the atmosphere. It takes me back to when I last played Ocarina of Time, and how I'm almost carrying on that adventure that I left behind in the era of time. I also don't really like the baby gomers in the Temple of Time at all. For me, they're more annoying than anything, especially in that one room with the lift. Though I will say it's really satisfying to squash them later on with the statue, so eh, maybe I'll chuck that one off. Apart from that, I don't really have much to say about the Temple of Time. One day I'm sure I'll delve into the lore of every dungeon in the series for videos, so I'll leave that one for another time since I imagine this has a lot to delve into, which leaves us with the boss. Now, I hate spiders more than anything else in the world. The thought of a tarantula makes my skin crawl and makes my eyeballs want to grow legs of their own and crawl away. Truly, I hate them. But that's why fighting them in video games is so amazing. It gives me an outlet to get over my fear. And I think in a way it's worked. In recent years, I've gotten over my fear of spiders far more than I think I would have if I didn't play games, which sounds like an odd game theory experiment or something. <laughs> But the point is that I think Armagoma, like the vast majority of the bosses in Twilight Princess, absolutely nails how epic the fight is. It's not the hardest, but by virtue of being a giant spider, it makes it harder for me, and I guess other spider haters, to actually just fight the thing. But when you boil it down, this boss is a piece of piss but it definitely has that feel that the rest of the bosses in this game have. After defeating that monstrosity, we move on to the next part of the main quest, helping Shad to decipher ancient script of an ancient civilization. Honestly, after Tears of the Kingdom, Shad just feels like Toro's nerdier younger brother, but anyway, let's get into it. The Shad quest is okay. I guess. It basically has you running through the map searching for various symbols around Hyrule. I don't dislike it, but I do think it's one of the low points of the game for me personally. The act of finding ancient text is cool when you're told that's what you're doing, but actually doing it just isn't for me. It has you exploring the world, finding owl statues, using the dominion rod and resetting the statues to their original position, thus granting you another part of the missing word that Shad is trying to figure out. When I do my full retrospective and I stitch all of these videos together, I'm going to add a separate section for the world of Hyrule and the side quests. But I'll say that I am a big fan of this version of Hyrule, but by this point in the game, I've done my fair share of running around and trying to appease the Golden Goddesses. I'd rather just have a small thing to do in Kakariko Village and then get sent up to the city in the sky. That being said, I know many of you out there are big simps for Shad, so just know that I see you and I accept you wholeheartedly. Now we come to the city in the sky, and to be honest, this is probably the most mixed that I feel on a dungeon in this game. I'm not entirely sure, but I feel like I might have said something about how the forest temple from the start of the game is only better than one other, but I might retract that statement now. The bulk of my thoughts in this dungeon is that atmospherically it is a treat for both the eyes and the ears. Most of the stuff I love about Arbiter's Ground and Snowpeak Ruins is present in City in the Sky, but in that same vein, most of the stuff that I feel is only okay in dungeons like the Temple of Time and Forest Temple is also present. Personally speaking, I think the City in the Sky has the least interesting puzzles and level design of any dungeon in the game. I think the problem in this regard is more so to do with the fact that the actual look, lore and feel of the city is so good that it makes the comparatively pretty meh puzzles feel much more lacklustre than they really are. I think one of the main reasons why it can feel like that sometimes to me is that for the first half of the dungeon you're mostly using the claw shot, right? That's all good. The claw or hook shot is one of the cooler items in the series for sure. 
but when the entire item for the dungeon is a second claw shot, I just don't find the puzzles that interesting because I've already been using that item for the last 20 minutes before getting a second one of that same item. Now, I won't downplay how cool it feels to zip around using two claw shots. Even before I'd completed Twilight Princess for the first time, I wanted the double claw shots. But in practice, they can make for some pretty tedious design. Usually the extent of a double claw shot puzzle will be to claw onto something and then wait for something to come closer to you, zip over to something else quickly. I'm not saying this is bad by any means, since I don't think any single dungeon in this game is bad. I do think the level design of the city in the sky is just dull, nothing less. That's enough of my negativity though because it's time to lump some positivity on the city in the sky. The atmosphere is insanely good for this area, it's actually one of the first times that I think the Zelda series cracked the Breath of the Wild atmosphere before that game released. The music isn't that memorable in my eyes, but that's not because it's bad, it just blends into the background so perfectly that I barely recognise that it's there, much like a lot of the music in the last couple of titles. Along with that, we're exploring the city of an ancient race, of which a member or multiple members of that race have been found around the hero over the course of the story. That makes the drive to explore the area way higher. Unless there's a reason I've missed, it is a little strange that this place had residents. Like, where do or like did you live? In this little area behind a rotating platform? But barring that, it's very interesting thematically. Plus, I've always been an enjoyer of the simple concept of falling from a high place. In every single game with a very tall object, the first thing I like to do is go to the top of that tall object and jump off it. Something about that process is very satisfying to me, I don't know why. I even did it with Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, so having that be the challenge of most of this dungeon is great. The mini boss is an Eralfos, and it's pretty good. Simple again, but it's set out more like a duel with a soldier instead of fighting a beast. And I like that about this mini boss personally. It's an in between of why I like the Dark Nuts versus other beast like enemies. The boss of this area is definitely one of the most talked about in Twilight Princess in my experience online, Argorok. And I think, once again, that's mostly because of the spectacle. I do like the use of the claw shots in this area more than I do for puzzles though. Zipping from one P hat to the next is a whole lot of fun, especially when you're trying to get behind the boss as fast as possible. Plus, Link stabbing what is basically a miniature dragon from behind is so insanely cool. There's not too much behind the design of the actual fight, but again, the design of the boss is very much on point. With that, I don't think there's much more to say about the city in the sky. Overall, I find the puzzles unremarkable enough that I don't have too much to say. Though, if I was to praise one other part of the dungeon, there's that one section where you're hooking all around different walls and the walls aren't moving, and for some reason, I always remember this section way more than the rest. I don't know, I don't know why, but I guess I just like that section. It releases the nice piece of dopamine that the rest of the city in the sky doesn't do for me personally. Unremarkable, but for me, I can see why someone might enjoy it way more than me. We grab the final piece of the Mirror of Twilight, and we move onwards once more to Zant. Passing through the mirror to get to the Palace of Twilight is one of my favourite moments in a Zelda game, period. We'll talk about the overall quality of the dungeon in a minute, but simply passing into a new realm of being in a 3D space is very surreal. Up until Twilight Princess, there had been instances of outright travelling to other realms, but we'd never really seen it in a 3D title. Ocarina of Time had you going forwards or backwards in time, Majora's Mask probably had you going through some kind of different realm or something, but it's never really outright stated. Wind Waker had another time travelling section, but that was it. Majora's Mask is, and probably will always be, the weirdest Zelda game in terms of the themes, and the moon as an area is very strange. But personally, the Palace of Twilight is the most unknown and, dare I say, scariest location in the entire series personally, barring maybe the depths, and it's because nothing in this area is as it should be. Whereas in the moon in Majora's Mask, there's a hint of normalcy. The sky is still blue, there's a big ash tree, grass is growing, the palace isn't like that at all. There are floating lands where otherworldly people might live, there are members of the twilight that physically can't function as normal members of society because of Xant and someone else's meddling. You're placed in the middle of a completely unknown territory. Legitimately, the best comparison I can make to how Link would be feeling in this situation is... Well, imagine if you were raiding a castle with your comrades back in the... I don't know what year. The enemy knows you're coming, and you're the first one into the middle of the castle. That is exactly how Link would be feeling if he wasn't the most courageous bastard you ever did see. 
Being honest, it's been so long since I first started up the series that I can't remember what I have or haven't said about the atmosphere of areas overridden with the twilight, but I can say that atmospherically they're my favourite areas in the franchise. Honestly, most of the areas in the twilight are fairly tedious, I will fully admit, but because of the time period that I first played this game and because of my genuine pure love for the story and the idea of exploring realms, these areas do it for me. They scare me in game, but then they also give me safety in real life since this is my comfort game. It's a strange thing, but it's a nice reminder that not everything is black and white and that nuance is a thing. So it should go without saying that the Palace of Twilight basically being the birth pod for all of that atmosphere means that I do have some bias for it because the actual dungeon in of itself has some pretty hit or miss puzzles. Some can be tedious, but for some reason, in this case, those tedious sections are what I like. Getting a ball back to a pedestal before a giant floating technological hand grabs it can be tedious, but it gives me just that right amount of pressure and stress that I'm trying to run back as far as my little legs will let me, but I just can't go any faster. But the hand is gaining on me and I just can't- you get the point. The tension is something I like about some older Zelda dungeons that I don't think newer ones have nailed down just yet. This seems like a good time to talk about the enemies in this area. Most of them are just the Twilight enemies you've come to expect at this point, but I think that works in the dungeon's favour because I find myself being reminded of how weak I was at the start of my journey through the light versus how strong I am now and how easy it is to obliterate a lot of these enemies with the Master Sword. Going back to the structure, I like the idea of going from one building to the next to the centre. That gives me happy feelings personally. I like it. It's another thing I don't have a reason for, but I do like it. I guess I like seeing my progress clearly outlined, and that is a very clear way of showing it. Oh, and then dude, then there's the section where you imbue light into the Master Sword to slash down darkness in the coolest fashion possible. I remember first playing this dungeon and thinking that was the coolest thing ever. The rest of the Palace of Twilight isn't much to write home about, honestly. The puzzles from then on are mostly traversal based, and they're pretty decent. It's nice being able to free the citizens of the Twilight from the Twilight. It's also nice knowing that this probably makes Midna happy, and at this point in the game, that is all I'm thinking about. The two stars of the show here are definitely the atmosphere and the boss. The mini boss Phantom Zant is a nice callback to Phantom Ganons of old, but nothing more. The real Zant though, his boss is a whole trip and is probably my favourite in the franchise specifically for making you use your entire item set to beat him. Overall, there are better bosses. Even in this game, there's one that's better, but I think the old formula of boss design needing you to use an item to open up a boss, but I think that was perfected in this fight against Zant. It's basically a gauntlet versus the Usurper King, going through a ton of areas you've already played through thus far, and using items that you first acquired in those areas. And he takes quite a few hits to take down, he's given you these big memory hits of your journey thus far and how it's all led up to this. You take the last swing of your sword, Zant falls to the ground, but you're reminded of what the Twilight King said before the fight begun. He ran into Ganondorf the Demon King when he was locked in this realm by the Sages, meaning that he was using Zant as a stepping stone and would likely already be in Hyrule while Link is still in the Twilight Realm. Midna blasts a tiny fraction of her ancestor's magic at Zan and basically destroys the poor lad. With this victory and the fact that the Fused Shadow can be used to great effect, the duo step back outside of the Twilight Realm and they move closer towards their next and final task, Ganondorf, who would be laying in wait of the hero of Hyrule and the Twilight Princess. These are the patrons and members of this channel, Sumji and Thomas Ruiwang are especially cool for being top paying patron people, especially at the minute, I can't thank you enough. Please subscribe for more weekly Zelda content, maybe, and I'll see you soon.